Okay, hi everybody. We're gonna start in just a couple minutes. We're waiting for everybody to come in and we will get started. Welcome. Okay, um, welcome everybody. My name is Amy Barron. I am the founder and executive director of I Was Supposed to Have a Baby. And we are here tonight for our second lecture, our post-pandemic and post-pandemic lecture talking about re-entry after COVID. And what we've done over this series, what we did actually in the first series is talk about individuals in the own, the, uh, my own community, the community that we work with at I Was Supposed to Have a Baby. And we talked about the infertility community, the loss community, and also anyone who has lost a parent, who has lost a member of their family. And we discussed all of the different ways that individuals in those communities might feel a little bit hesitant to sort of come back and re-enter society after trauma and different, different things in their lives that have been painful and filled with struggle have, have occurred to them. Tonight, we're taking a slight turn and we're discussing other segments of our larger community that sit with different pieces that are difficult and try to understand their situation, try to understand their plight and see how we can be more supportive of what they're going through and help them as they ease back into society, as we all ease back into society, but trying to understand a little bit more about their daily occurrences, their thoughts and their feelings and how we come back. And so they, how they come back. And so the things that we're thinking about tonight and the, the issues that we're, we're going to be discussing are things like mental illness, how it's just emotionally and, and just in every way, it's for some people, it's really exhausting to be around large crowds. And it was very nice for them to be at home so they didn't have to present all of the time. They prefer these small inter intimate gatherings and being in large settings is just really draining. And it, it sort of touches on so many pieces that they're just not interested in talking about it. And it really taps them of, zaps them, taps them of, of their energy. They, what we hear a lot and what I've heard from my community, especially those that are dealing with mental illness is that, you know, they really struggled because they, like, they, they, they wanted connection and they wanted to be with people. But on the other hand, it was really nice to be alone. So that's one segment of society. Another segment of society are those dealing with acute or chronic illnesses. You know, sometimes like what we know is that people go through lots of things in their lives, things that we don't necessarily know, understand, because often these things are invisible, as is mental illness, obviously. And the and some some people have developed developed these illnesses or developed these issues while being on lockdown and while being closed. And so the question now is people don't know that they're struggling with these kinds of issues. How, how do I even begin to tell them? How do I share with them? Do I want to maintain my privacy? You know, these are some of the things that we're going to be discussing tonight. Then a third segment are individuals or family members who have disabilities. And these, uh, these could be disabilities that are perfectly obvious to the eye or disabilities that are hidden. And what this community often feels is that they really, they're often excluded because of physical capabilities or others. Sometimes there's, if someone is in a wheelchair, or there isn't a ramp, there isn't accessibility for them to get where they need to go. But then they, and they also feel that it was much easier for them to be inside where sort of COVID was like the great equalizer in the sense that they could use their screens. They could, they could just talk to a screen and not have to physically have these issues getting around. And that's only one kind of disability. So we're gonna be talking about a few different types, as many as possible, and try to figure out ways that we can be more inclusive and more sensitive to people who are dealing with those kinds of issues. Um, and then lastly, and not really lastly, but just sort of fourthly, if that's a word, which I'm sure it's not, um, we're gonna be discussing 
body image issues. And I, you know, this, this has been a real hot topic for lots and lots of people as they re-enter back in the world. You know, all of us have had lots and lots of exercise during our lockdown from our couch to our refrigerator and from our refrigerator back to our bedroom. And I think many of us, myself included, have put on weight during this time because we haven't been doing the amount of exercise that we normally do, just even walking around our neighborhood as much. And, but besides the weight and moving really off the weight, there are physical changes that we're gonna be noticing in other people's bodies. Their bodies have gotten smaller, the bodies have gotten bigger. People have gone gray, people have started, you know, wearing some kind of clothes, not wearing some kind of clothes, wearing makeup, not wearing makeup. There are a million things that people have decided over the course of this pandemic and these lockdown that they've just, their, their outward image is different than they were before. And so the question is, what do we do? What do we say? Do we say nothing? Do we say something and how? And so these are the things we're gonna be trying to address a little bit of tonight. And the hope is that each of you walk away feeling that you've been seen, but also that you walk, up, walk away with a tangible recognition that these kinds of issues exist in our community. And what we can do, if you walk away with just one thing that you might be able to do that's a little bit different than what you were doing before, to try to embrace those members of our community that are dealing with some of these things, then we will have considered this program to be a success. So now I'm gonna stop talking and lead you and introduce you to our amazing panel. So we have Miriam Ament, who is the founder and executive director of No Shame on You. We have Melissa Rosen, who is the education coordinator for Sharsharet. We have Sarah Weinberger Lippman, PhD, who is a therapist and who psychologist, excuse me, um, who deals with body image issues and many, many other pieces in the um, body image and fertility and eating disorder realm. Um, and we have Nava Selton, also PhD, who is a developmental psychologist who among her myriad of talents and accolades, um, the reason why she's here tonight is specifically because of her work with, um, with the community that deals has disabilities. And she talks a lot about in inclusion. She had a phenomenal run of an off-Broadway show and she created this entire series. She'll talk to you more about this. So I'm gonna stop talking now and have each of the panelists introduce themselves and then we're gonna get right into it. So Miriam, you're up. Okay, thank you so much, Amy. Um, my name is Miriam Ament. I am, as Amy said, I'm the founder and executive director of No Shame On You. No Shame On You is a nonprofit founded in 2014, dedicated to eliminating the stigma associated with mental health conditions and raising mental health awareness in the Jewish community and beyond. And our goal is for the people who need help to seek it, for family members and friends to know how to provide proper support and to save lives. And to give you a little back about, background about how it got started, um, over 15 years ago, I was hospitalized three times for depression and faced a lot of stigma. Uh, the best example of that is during my second hospitalization, one of my then closest friends called me while I was in the hospital and said, I only want to talk to you when you're happy. So let's not talk again for a while. And then I never heard from her again. So that uh, was pretty devastating and led me to keep my hospitalizations a secret not tell anyone, only a few friends knew and, and my family. And then uh, 10 years later, which is now about six or seven years ago, I had the opportunity to meet the actress Glenn Close, who was a very big mental health advocate. And we, it's a long story, but whatever, one thing led to another, we went to lunch and I ended up telling her my whole story. And I realized that if I can tell Glenn Close, this legendary actress, I can have a really big impact in my community. And that is what led me to start No Shame On You. And that is my story. Amazing, amazing. I am so, I only met you a few weeks ago and I am just, I've been awed by the work that you do and your story and just, I'm so happy that you're here. Um, Melissa. So as Amy said, my name is Melissa Rosen. I am the director of training and education at Char Charette. 
For those of you who are unfamiliar, Sharsheret provides free psychosocial support, free emotional support to anyone going through either heightened diagnostic risk or a diagnosis of breast or ovarian cancer. Um, anybody impacted, including caregivers, family members, we do that through a variety of ways, but our, our programs, our support programs are all 100% free. Um, and we are a Jewish organization, although our programs are, are open to absolutely anybody who needs that support. Um, we're national, so any, wherever anybody's located, they can access our, our resources. Um, I think the, with regard to myself, I've been with Shar Sherritt for close to seven years, and myself, I'm a two-time cancer survivor, um, once seven, just over seven years ago, and once 17 years prior to that. So that does a lot to inform my work, although I have been working in the nonprofit Jewish community for 30 years now. Thank you, Melissa. You are... You are incredible. And we're so happy that you're here to talk about your experiences and shed light in, in, on so many of these issues. Thank My you. Pleasure to be here. Dr. Weinberger Littman. Thank you, Dr. Barron. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I, first of all, I just wanna say that um, <clears throat> I'm really honored to be included on this panel of these incredibly amazing and illustrious and accomplished women. So thank you for including me. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Sarah. I am a health psychologist, and I'm a professor at Marymount Manhattan College, where I am so fortunate to have my esteemed colleague, Dr. Nava Silton, working by my side for over a decade now. It's the best part of my job, really. Um, and for the last over 15 years now, I have been studying issues related to body image, disordered eating, sexuality, eating disorders, a little bit of infertility um, in the Jewish community, particularly within the Orthodox Jewish community. Um, and I've uh, also been looking um, and working a lot with how we integrate religion and spirituality into both mental and physical health, how it impacts our health, how we can use it in psychotherapy, why it's so important. Um, and that could be any you know religious or spiritual um, traditions. So, um, I think that these are issues that impact all of us, especially women, but increasingly really everybody. So thank you so much for having me. We are honored as well. Dr. Selton. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Barron. And thank you so much, Dr. Weinberger Littman for that beautiful uh, introduction. Um, I uh, also am a psychology professor at Marymount Manhattan College. I'm a developmental psychologist by training. I am here, um, as Amy alluded to, uh, because I created a children's comic book series called Real Abilities, uh, which teaches about 13 different disabilities. Um, and it tries to uh, it kind of teach about the disabilities in such a way that it can increase kids' empathy, knowledge, sensitivity when it appears with disabilities. And we've also moved towards mental health disorders for a older age bracket as well. So the uh, Real Abilities comic book series relating to disabilities is for eight to 11 year olds. And the comic book series pertaining to mental health disorders is for 11 to 15 year olds. And we also have an off-Broadway musical um, that teaches again about disabilities, about kindness, about celebrating the beauty of difference. And so um, those are two things that um, relate to my work in disabilities and in children's media. I also am fortunate to have two beautiful, wonderful nephews on the autism spectrum. And I'm really looking forward to speaking with you more about disabilities specifically related to COVID. And I am beyond honored to share the floor with all of you uh, illustrious speakers. So thank you so much for having me. Excellent. Okay, so Dr. Silton, I'm going to actually tap you first, just because you were the last one to speak. I, I want to. This question is really for all of you in the in in on the panel, but I'm going to ask you first. What what people are most interested in is they want to know what are the particular stressors for people in your community, and and specifically, you know, in their general life, but also specifically during the pandemic, and now 
how have have things changed now that you're starting things are starting to open up so i'm going to ask you first to sort of take that and give us a window into the life of someone who has some sort of disability and what they're experiencing thank you so much and it's a wonderful question and in fact in preparation i actually read through a throng of research articles and spoke to a throng of people um, just to try to really represent as many voices as possible here. So just to start with a laundry list and then to get more specific, um, one of the things that might be surprising is that having an intellectual disability was actually the strongest risk factor for presenting with the COVID-19 diagnosis and the strongest independent risk factor um, other than age for COVID-19 mortality. So why is this the case? Why is it that individuals with disabilities are at a significant disadvantage here, are significantly vulnerable here? So just a couple of things to keep in mind. First of all, um, why are they at higher risk of con contracting the virus? So one, one thing, and it's simple, one thing is pretty simple, masks, wearing masks. It seems easy enough to put on a mask, but individuals who have sensory issues or individuals who have anxiety or post-traumatic stress disorder, Wearing a mask could be really problematic. If you have a breathing issue, wearing a mask also could be a very difficult thing to do. Um, and for that reason, um, that, that puts them at a greater disadvantage. When you have a cognitive disability, it might be harder to understand some of the social distancing requirements that are needed. Um, so some of these are related. And unfortunately, of course, with everything on lockdown and everything closed out, a lot of people really could not access their regular health care. They couldn't access their therapists, the individuals who would actually um, give them services, whether they be educational services or therapeutic services. And so this was a huge loss for many individuals in the disability community. And you might say, well, what about telehealth, right? Um, why, why can't they make use of telehealth? Well, right, I was actually just going to ask you that. What happened to telehealth? Right. So what we don't realize is that when we're using Zoom, you know, most people aren't putting captioning on their Zoom. So if you have a, um, you know, if you have a hearing disability, you're missing out. If you're a lip reader um, and uh, people are in a, you're watching a classroom of people and you're not looking directly at someone's lips, you're missing out on that communication. You're missing out on that knowledge. The same with visual disabilities. Or let's say you're someone with a cognitive disability who has a hard time working with a computer and figuring out how to access Zoom or how to put in a meeting ID and passcode or whatever it might be. So even with telehealth, there can be concerns. And when you look at education, a lot of individuals with disabilities really struggled because they had hybrid models where they were half time on Zoom, half time in person. And one thing that we all benefit from is structure all the more so for individuals with disabilities. When you keep switching it up and one week you have school, the next week you don't, the next week, oh, do we, don't we, right? That loss of structure, that loss of a routine was hugely problematic. And even if they were able to have Zoom educational lessons, um, often you would need someone there to support you, to help you access that Zoom educational environment. So a lot of parents had to leave work um, so that they could access those educational opportunities for their children. So these are just some of the many, many things that we don't always um, think about. And one more I'll just mention, and there are tons to talk about, but one more I'll just mention is um, there are some individuals who have verbal disabilities and they're, they're not able to report when they're feeling symptoms. So they may be presenting with symptoms of COVID or feeling unwell, but are unable to you know, verbally um, explain how they're feeling. Um, and that limited communication um, could also really um, be a, an issue and a barrier towards getting the care that they need. Wow, I, I, I mean, I, I've I've thought about some of these issues, but I, I you've just mentioned I, I a million more that I'm just beginning. Obviously, all of us are just beginning to understand. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Lipman. You know. <clears throat> I'm not sure that there's any one community at this point that is vulnerable, right? To sort of body image, body dissatisfaction more than any other. I just think that COVID to some extent has heightened it for all of us. Um, the thing that I really wanna say is that 
all of us have experienced varying degrees of stress and trauma when it comes to COVID. Some of us have had much more, some of us have contracted COVID, some of us have lost family members. But even for those of us that haven't, we've had a collective trauma. And it's actually our bodies that have seen us through this pandemic, which we know unfortunately is also not over. And so it's gonna have to continue sustaining us, right? So we've all survived, whatever that looks like, right? Some of us have survived in a much more literal way. Some of us has, have survived psychologically. Some of us have survived through isolation. And we are not the same and our bodies are not the same. Our bodies are not the same as they were before COVID, whether it's in a very physical way, because like you said, there's less activity, there's more activity, there's change in appetite, there's you know increase, decrease uh, that we know is a result of emotional upheaval and is a normal neurological response to stress, right? Um, so I'm not even sure if I'm answering your question very specifically, right? I think that there are so many changes that we've gone through and so many sensitivities and things that we um, need to pay attention to as we literally allow our bodies, which have uh, you know, sustained us and kept us alive, re-emerging you know, after one of the you know, greatest catastrophes that in many ways that many of us have ever lived through. Um, so I just think that that's a, a moment of perspective to sort of be mindful and thankful and grateful um, for sort of what our bodies have done for us over these last 18 months um, at this point. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, in a thousand <laughs> ways, yes, is, is really all I have to say to that. Um, Melissa. So obviously I'm going to speak from the perspective of someone facing breast or ovarian cancer, but the reality is that so much of what I talk about is relevant to all cancer, any chronic illness, any other acute illness that's come up. Come up. Um, in terms of the issues that have affected this community during COVID, um, I think there are two really big ones. Uh, the first one was the necessary delay of screening tests and of certain treatments. And what that means practically is that we're seeing a lot more later stage cancer than we would have two years ago. Um, you know, at some point, people literally general screenings for mammograms, for example, were were shut down. Um, and although that didn't last too too long, it didn't take um, more than a couple months to figure out what to do to keep patients safe. It did mean that a a ridiculously large number of people didn't get their mammograms in a timely fashion, and when they reopened. Um, it meant that there were months to possibly wait. The same for people who were diagnosed. Certain treatments could not be done at the beginning because no, unless it was a, an absolute emergency, nobody was going to a hospital. So they would switch around treatments and try and do something first rather than surgery first, um, maybe something like tamoxifen, whatever it is. Um, the National Cancer Institute has said that um, because among other things, screen, routine screenings went down as much as 90% in certain parts of our country, wow. that they expect COVID to negatively impact cancer outcomes for the next decade. Wow. So, right. So this isn't going away anytime soon. We'll be dealing with repercussions. And with those physical repercussions, of course, there are emotional um, repercussions. And, and that sort of leads to the second thing that was a real impact for our community. You know, having a diagnosis of a significant illness is, of course, one of the most stressful times of someone's life. And one of the times, one of the most perhaps fearful times as well, and one of the times when we most rely on the friends and family we have, those who were going to treatment, who were going to surgery, couldn't have loved ones accompany them. 
chemotherapy treatments, which can sometimes, depending on the tre specific treatment, last for hours, had to sit there alone. And, and so this lack of support when one needs support the most, coupled with, some, for some, a more difficult diagnosis has really been traumatic for the, for the breast cancer community, for the cancer community, and I would guess for many, many other illnesses. Um, and, and, you know, just now we're just starting to let people come in. Um, and there's no guarantee that we'll even stay because we've all read that in certain parts of the country, there are big jumps again. So this may go back. Um, you know, when we talk about coming back into our larger community, there are other concerns, of course, as well. Um, you mentioned earlier, who should I tell? How should I tell? Do I have to tell? Um, you know, all of us in some way talk about potential changes to the body that might indicate a change. How do we react when people talk to us about it? And if you notice a change, how do you react? And I think we're going to talk about that a little bit more in the next yeah. question or two. So I'm not going to go into that now. But those are some of the main concerns that we've been facing for the last 18 months and will continue to face a little bit longer. Thank you. I, I look, these, these conversations are so important because we, we need this window to try to understand what people are going through. So thank you. Um, Miriam. Thank you. So I um, am going to speak from the perspective of mental health and 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 the mental health community and, and individuals with mental health conditions. So a lot of what people, some people were experiencing isolation, um, people who live alone, people, t teens and, and young adults who, you know, used to having social lives and all of a sudden that's pulled away from them, extracurriculars pulled away from them. Um, but people of all ages were really experiencing a lot of isolation, which led to depression and anxiety and um, which unfortunately we're all on the rise. And then um, specifically talking about anxiety, there are so many unknowns and you know how, how to anticipate, there, there's no anticipating like, like Melissa was just saying, we now know things were better and now, now there's you know, some, you know, a lot of uncertainty again about what direction things are going in. So managing that uncertainty and managing um, the anxiety that goes along with not knowing what's gonna happen from day to day and what kind of news are we gonna get today. And then also loss was a big um, uh, part of what uh, people were experiencing and, and really had an impact on the, on, on the mental health of people because they lost, whether it's losing out on graduation, losing out on having the wedding you wanted, on you know, the bar mitzvah for your kid that you wanted, whatever it is, there was so much loss um, and, and, and just for kids, even just going to school and missing out on fifth grade or, you know, you know, all of that um, just had a tremendous um, and has continued to have a tremendous effect on people. I know now camps are open this summer and, you know, there's some stuff that was lost last summer that are back, but there's still um, a lot of people sort of dealing with the loss of, of parts of their lives that they thought they'd have and milestones they thought they'd experience that, um, you know, because of the pandemic didn't happen. So I'd say those are some of the key areas. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I feel like this this is a question that each of you can answer and spend an hour on, right? Like, like it's it's absolutely unanswerable. I mean, to I, I feel I, I feel terrible, you know, giving you a short time period and say, please answer this for me in a few minutes because it's really it's 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 just unfathomable the different pieces that this community has been through. Um, but let's let's like. Now that we've like sort of talked about COVID a little bit and, and sort of what the challenges were specifically in the last, you know, 16, 17, 18 months, whatever it is. And for some, it, it's still very much that way because of vaccination issues, because of, you know, health issues that are, you know, keeping them inside and keeping them away from people because they're still so worried about getting out, even if they are vaccinated. Like, can you each give us sort of, a, a, a window into the life of what someone in your community, what, what that looks like beyond COVID. And, and Melissa, I'm going to sort of point this more at you to start out with, um, because de just specifically dealing with the, the immunocompromisation, it's definitely not a word, but I think all of you know what I'm talking about, being immunocompromised, that 
isolates, it necessitates isolation even beyond what COVID is. And I'm sure COVID overlaid, you know, so many of these, these other pieces. So can you talk to us and tell us a little bit more about what sort of a typical, and I'm using that word in a ridiculous way, but what a typical day or experience would be for someone who's struggling and dealing with cancer? Absolutely. So I think the first thing I just need to say, you know, is that what I'm giving is not medical advice and everybody should talk to their own health care provider. Um, and also it's difficult because depending on this, the, the place you are in your cancer experience, depending on your exact diagnosis, depending on the treatment you're receiving, um, you may feel differently, your doctor may guide you differently. So these are, are truly generalizations, but it's true that when someone is going through cancer treatment, um, certainly a good number of cancer treatments, there is a level of being immunocompromised, which means you're more at risk for contracting the common cold, the flu, and then of course COVID, right? That's that's just what happens. So um, and, and for some, it's not even just treatment. There are some cancers, blood and like lymph, sy sy lymph system cancers could also raise uh, the level of risk. So, so that really, when you know you're more at risk, that takes over your life, right? You, you while your friends may be going not thinking twice about going to the supermarket or signing their child up for camp or or any of those normal things, taking an outside walk or having a, a picnic outside somewhere. For you, that still may be an issue. Um, and that was more sort of in the thick of things. But even now, when, when I go into a supermarket and I'm wearing my mask, um, even though I've been vaccinated, even though I'm not actively undergoing treatment, I'm wearing my mask and I look around and where I live, 90% of the people aren't wearing masks. And so I feel that that puts people who are immunocompromised at higher risk. Um, so, so along with the isolation of facing illness by themselves, they're not, they're likely ordering or have ordered um, their food in through a delivery service. They're not doing what's deemed safe social activities um, that uh, many others are doing. And I, I think, and they've invested in Purell, carry wipes with them everywhere, all of those things. Um, but I think the biggest issue right now in summer of 2021 is this anxiety that things are returning to normal and I can't, or I, I don't want to yet. I'm not comfortable. And, and even outside of this, there are people, let's remember, no matter, you know, no matter if someone has a diagnosis or not, there are people who are getting back to normal, whatever that's going to mean, a lot slower than others. It's very much a personal decision based on your normal anxiety, your understand it, your health, your, your own personal health, the health of people around you. I see my parents on a regular basis. And even though they've been vaccinated, they're both at much higher risk. So I wanna be careful not to bring things in. So people are going through um, this transition back toward normal at very different rates. And I think there's a lot of anxiety that some people will be left behind. Um, and I, I think, you know, in the people I talk to now, this is the biggest issue. Yes, we're used to dealing with all of these other issues right now, but, but this very second, we're very worried about being left behind. Okay, that's yeah. It's it's a lot. It's a lot to hold. Amy, but... I can't hear you, even though you don't look to be muted. Can you mute and unmute? How about now? Good. Okay. Can you can hear her, Nava? I can't hear her. Yeah. Okay. I can. Okay, I can. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. I I'm glad some of you can hear me. Now I can. Um, okay. I, I it, it's no, I just, I was just commenting that, you know, that everything that you just said is just a lot to hold. And I think that, you know, all of us are going to have a lot to, to really think about as we're, we're continuing on with this. Um, Dr. Empathy. Hilton. 
we're going to yeah. develop empathy for the people I, around us. Look, I, I, we are, you know, one of the last things we're going to talk about today is what can we do, the real take-homes, and we are definitely going to get to that. So thank you. Um, Dr. Selton, tell us about about individuals with disabilities. Tell us what what it, what it feels like for them. So we met, I already alluded to the masks and, you know, if someone has a hearing disability, if there's no window in that mask and they're used to lip reading, how they feel very isolated. They feel like they are not able to join uh, the communication, the world of communication, and that, that makes them feel isolated and not part of society. So that's, that's one, one thing. And then you can imagine if you have a visual disability or a physical disability, as it is, there was such a lack of accessibility for people to go anywhere during lockdown, but just even trying to, you know, get small things done could be more complicated. But I want to focus a little bit more just to give you kind of a day in the life of someone who has, let's say, a son on the autism spectrum and how challenging the educational environment was for parents. So here, they would typically have schools with really wonderful ratios of faculty to students. They'd have a variety of therapies. So you, when you have a son or daughter on the autism spectrum, you'll often have physical therapy and um, you know ABA, applied behavioral analysis therapy and uh, occupational therapy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you really have in place these wonderful support systems, wonderful educational environment with wonderful ratios. Um, and you have all that in place. And all of a sudden COVID happens and those people can't get to your home anymore. Um, you are only meeting on Zoom, you know, you're, you're only either you're completely on Zoom or you have that hybrid model and you have parents who are typically at work and now need to help, as I said, that child access the technology that they often couldn't, cannot independently access. And so you can imagine how tremendously that impacted the family unit and, and then add in socio, you know, lower socioeconomic status or single parent homes. You know, there's so many different demographics that were really highly vulnerable during this time. So, you know, again, everyone was so excited to come back to school uh, when the schools opened up again. Um, but uh, a lot of people, you know, uh, only had that hybrid model or only were still on Zoom or a lot of individuals with disabilities also have comorbid other disorders that health disorders that may have prevented them from you know, getting back uh, in vivo right in the educational environment. So you can just imagine the anxiety for parents, the challenges, the financial stressors, um, and the lack of therapeutic support their kids were getting. And so a lot of parents also were very fearful and anxious about the kind of, kind of COVID slump, the COVID academic slump of their students who were working so hard to get somewhere, you know, losing out on academics, and even more importantly for autism, losing out on that socio-emotional um, engagement, that opportunity to engage with other students and to keep up those socio-emotional interactions. So that's just painting a little bit of a picture of what a day in the life, some of the stressors that, some of the many stressors that, um, that were involved. And you've only given us a window. I mean, you talked about some others beforehand and you mentioned a few here, but you you only gave us a snapshot and I, you know, what was it? A two minute snapshot of someone who has a child, you know, that has autism or is on the autistic spectrum. I mean, that's not even accounting for the gazillions of other disabilities that someone might have or have a child with. So I, yeah, this is, this is, I, it's a lot to hold. It's a lot to hold. And I think that, a lot of us, like it's so good that we're having this conversation because we we each had our own stressors as we were working through the last number of months. And so it helps all of us to hear what other people are going through because we were all very much trying to survive our own bubble. Um, and so this is, I, I'm, I'm so glad that that we all, that all of you are here to, to give us a little bit of more of a window. Um, Miriam, tell us a little bit about your community. So um, I mentioned uh, earlier about some, some of the things people were going through, like isolation and stuff like that. Some of the stuff I didn't touch on in terms of challenges were if someone had a relative in a residential treatment facility, whether they were there for a mental health condition or uh, a nursing home or assisted living, they couldn't see them for months upon months. And it was devastating both you know, for the loved one who couldn't visit and for the loved one in the facility. And that um, 
was a huge challenge that people face day in and day out of when am I going to get to see them and the uncertainty of, um, and even when vaccinations came, you know, there, there were still a lot of, it was a, uh, obviously a relief when vaccinations came and, and nursing homes were one of the first, you know, residential facilities got them relatively early and there were still rules in place and all that. So that was something that a lot of people um, dealt with that I, I wanted to mention. Another uh, aspect of this in terms of the isolation and getting together uh, and not being able to get together with people, um, you know, we actually, no shame on you, we were asked to create certain groups for people specifically who are living alone. So that was interesting, you know, an interesting thing from our community that we were specifically asked, you know, and people of all ages who were living alone for whatever reason, but just like to make sure that people felt connected and we, they had an opt-in for a contact list. So those were things that that we um, addressed in our community. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about is, is social anxiety disorder, which can happen not in a pandemic, but then in the pandemic when we're doing a lot on Zoom, you know, uh, social anxiety disorder has to do with feeling judged or worrying that you're going to be judged or rejected or someone's going to criticize you for what you said or how you look or something like that. And when we're on Zoom, we're sort of, it's almost, we're seeing people, we're only seeing from the neck up. So on the one hand, we don't have to worry, you know, a lot of people are in sweatpants, but on the other hand, we're, we're seeing people's faces so close up that a lot of people had social anxiety disorder about that and 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 managing being on Zoom and how to interact and what to interact and then and then the time is sort of delays sometimes and how that can interplay. So anyway, that was something that a lot of people in the community um, struggled with in terms of um, trying to communicate, whether it was for work or you know socially, and at the same time having the anxiety about uh, what are they going to think about how I look or my lighting or you know all that kind of stuff. So that was a, a, another big challenge on top of some of the other uh, challenges I already discussed. I think you're, you're muted, Amy. I, I realize, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> no matter how, how long any of us have been on Zoom, I think we've all talked on mute about a gazillion times. So what, I, I, can't, I can only imagine, it's only happened for me once, once so far. It'll happen many more times um, today. Um, so I, I was just saying that for me, it was such a gift to be able to be in pajamas and also none of you are seeing what I'm wearing on my bottom right now. Um, but I, I, I hadn't even considered this, the social anxiety piece. I know body dysmorphia, like people, I, I want Dr. Lippman, I want you to talk about that, that piece. And I, that was the first thing I was thinking of, of when people are constantly staring at, at uh, you know, the pictures of themselves, the images of themselves on Zoom, but I hadn't even considered the social anxiety piece of it. So, wow. Um, Dr. Lippman, what, what are your thoughts about all of this? So, so many, so many. Um, so, you know, as a health psychologist by training, everything I do is always sort of looking at the intersection between physical and mental health. So I feel like, I mean, I, on my Zoom screen, I'm literally sandwiched between Melissa and Miriam, and that's perfect for me. Um, because I feel like that's where my uh, focus lies, right? Like both in terms of what we're not able to accomplish in terms of our taking care of ourselves physically, you know, and emotionally. Um, so I want to speak to a, a couple of things. I also want to make a distinction between general body image issues that many of us experience and that many of us may have experienced to a greater extent during COVID and also, um, you know, clinical eating disorders, which Miriam really also goes into, you know, your camp of, of course, of mental illness, um, but also is a physical illness that people need to seek treatment for, right? And so um, just briefly, because, you know, Nava mentioned the limitations with things like telehealth, right? Or remote education, um, there are populations uh, whether we're talking about cancer treatment, psychological treatment, someone with disabilities, for whom, you know, virtual treatment is not going to work, right? Or it's okay, but it really can't replace, right, face-to-face um, -face interaction, right? So people that are dealing on a real clinical level with treating an eating disorder, which can be life-threatening, right, um, we're really just as impacted as people dealing with any chronic illness, both, you know, physical and psychological. And that's um, something that I really want to remind people of the severity of that and 
how we actually have seen um, increased severity in eating disorders because there, there's, as an aside, eating disorder treatment is often very difficult to access, even in major cities. Um, it's particularly difficult to access um, during COVID. Separate from that, right, those regular body image issues, the body dysmorphia, we've all read about the increase in cosmetic surgeries, plastic surgery procedures, right, post-COVID. One of the things I can just say, like a, a real a tip, a pro tip here, is that um, taking yourself, shutting off self-view so that you don't see yourself while you're talking is actually something not, not only that's helpful for all of us, but is, is clinically very useful for those people that have a variety of different kind of anxiety, whether it's looking at themselves, whether it's, you know, here I am fixing this fuzzy hair, right? Or whether it's just you are socially, you have, uh, you know, social anxiety in general and watching yourself interact is gonna make it worse. So that's just, um, and I actually started doing that when I teach because when I'm teaching in front of a class, you know, I'm making goofy faces and I'm engaging people and I don't know the goofy faces that I'm making, right? Um, and it, it's, I, I personally have found it very helpful and I've seen it be helpful for people. But um, I think Amy, you're absolutely right. We've seen just an increase in um, many of us who weren't even particularly preoccupied are like, wow, really, that's what I look like? And looking at ourselves every single day, for some of us that are on Zoom, hours a day is, is not normal, right? It's not typical. It's not how we present ourselves to the world. How much more self-conscious are we if we're constantly being reminded of the things that make us anxious, right, about ourselves? So I, I mean, a thousand percent. I, I mean, when you're staring at yourself in the mirror, like we're all thinking like, oh, I didn't realize I had that pimple right there, um, you know, and, and we're like, oh, my lipstick is like not on a hundred percent. Like we're all doing it, right? It's like ridiculous ridiculous. But Dr. Littman, okay, so now let me just ask you this, and, and we've talked about this in, in our group, and but what I really want to get at is some of the, and this is for all of you, but I'm going to specifically start with you, some of the like terrible things, the stupid things, the silly things, the like, oh, oh, I, I, I didn't mean to say that, but like uh, it came out the wrong way. Um, oh, oh, you know, the, the faux pas that all of us make. What are some of the things that have happened in your life and or yeah. happened, ha happened that you've seen happen, and I'm directing this out now, you yeah. know, at the rest of you, happened in either your own life or, you know, to individuals in your community, like the, the well-meaning stuff, but just really hits the wrong way. So let's, let's like liven this up a little bit and like make people laugh in a ridiculous, horrible way. So that, yeah. tell me, tell me your bar mitzvah story. I want to hear it. So I have, it's like, it's as if this was planted, right? Like as an eating disorder professional, I have a perfect story. So I've only gone to one social event um, and it was a bar mitzvah of a close relative and I was a close relative's child and I was very happy to go and see people that I had not seen in a very, very long time. And it was in a different community. Um, I didn't really know how to get dressed. I had to wear something that didn't have elastic and that was anxiety provoking enough. But also um, I happened to have been one of the only people that remained masked. And there was self-consciousness there. And I was really excited to see everyone. And a family member who I could have predicted did this, instead of saying like, oh my God, I haven't seen you in so long. It's so great to see you, greeted me with, oh my God, you haven't even gained the COVID-19. And I just walked away. Now, I don't find that triggering. I find that, you know, I don't want to say humorous, like I can shrug it off, but it's not because this is a woman who is in an elderly, you know, elderly, but she's definitely in a more vulnerable age group, right? Whose primary concern was that I didn't gain any weight during COVID, which she wouldn't even know because I haven't seen her in two years. Like she, th th there was no reality, right, in that statement. So it didn't impact me, 
but it may have severely impacted somebody else, right? Whether they are dealing with, you know, a, a clinical issue, right? Relating to an eating disorder or something else. I mean, so would, would you go over to someone and say, oh, I see you gained a nice amount of weight during COVID. Like, why is it okay? Why is it okay to comment on other people's bodies, even in the interest of right paying a compliment? Now, I will say, Melissa, and you tell me if this is okay. Like, I've had close friends who after mastectomy and I see them and I go over to them and I say, your boobs look amazing, right? That's, you know, someone that I'm close to and has, you know, gone through, you know, a trauma, has had reconstruction, right? I am not a person who comments on people's bodies normally, and I think this is a larger issue, but those are the kind of things that um, many of us are going to encounter. And I just happen to encounter that literally my first night of reentry. Yeah. I, and, and, and like, I could tell you the stories of like the gray hair and the like, you know, family members coming up to me and saying, oh, did you see what they, I'm like, no, I, I wasn't paying attention to their bodies. But now that you mention it, I'm like, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, Melissa, <laughs> your thoughts. So if you want to laugh, I go out and I speak to a lot of communities and a lot of patients in different uh, like hospital support groups and things like that. I have a variety of, of topics I speak on. And one of them is how to deal with the stupid things people say to you when you have cancer. <laughs> Okay, so the mere fact that we have a whole a whole talk about that is really indicative of, of, of a larger problem. But if you if you kind of lay that normal difficulty over COVID um, and people aren't seeing gradual change, but they're possibly seeing sudden change, it becomes even more um, complicated. When you notice somebody has lost their hair and people who are going through chemotherapy might choose to not do anything, but, but be exactly whatever their body is at the moment, they might choose to cover it with a scarf or a hat or a wig. But I'm telling you, it's not comfortable to acknowledge somebody's bald and it's not comfortable to not acknowledge somebody's bald. It's such an obvious change or in certain communities where women cover their hair after they're married with a wig perhaps. I, I've seen it happen um, myself where somebody will go over to somebody who is wearing a wig and it's, it's noticeable in these communities where you, know, you can tell when somebody is wearing a wig no matter how good it is to say, oh, you started covering your hair. So like, you know, over COVID, you've had a religious epiphany, you've gotten more traditional, whatever it is. Uh, uh, so like on either end of that spectrum, whether somebody has a lovely wig and in the shop, right, nobody would ever realize it was a wig or somebody is choosing not to cover their bald hair. People make inappropriate comments. Um, definitely that also certain treatments make you lose weight, certain treatments make you gain weight and gain weight in a very specific way, um, a, a unique looking way. Again, that's another thing that somebody shouldn't be commenting on. I know myself, I mentioned I was a two-time cancer survivor. The first time I was diagnosed, I lost a good 30 pounds within a month. And so many people, told me how amazing I looked that eventually I started, I was so distraught anyway, eventually after quite some time of being polite, I started saying, thanks, that's what cancer does to someone, you know, because again, so the question here is, is, you know, and we'll just touch upon it now and maybe go back to it later. The question here is, what are you supposed to do when you notice a distinct difference in someone well, the good news is that most people you'll encounter post COVID, you'll notice something about them. They, they've gone gray, they've lost weight, they've gained weight, they, they have a different hairstyle, they, what, whatever it is. 
So all you have to say, it, it, all you have to do is not ask a specific question, but you know, great to see you. Gosh, isn't it hard coming back? Let me know if there's anything I can do. If you suspect somebody has cancer, somebody's got something else going on, they don't want to, if they're going to tell you, they're going to tell you proactively. They, and it's probably not going to be in the shop, right? Or in Kiddush after Shabbat morning services, right? So all you can say is, it, it, you know, great to see you. So hard coming back, isn't it? Let me know if there's anything I can do. That's just a simple, neutral way. Because even if somebody isn't facing something extra difficult in this time, we're all facing, you know, right? Um, Dr. Littman said, we faced a collective trauma. We're all dealing with something. So that is the best way to go about it. Definitely, definitely. And, and you're a thousand percent right. We've all changed. The question is how? And sometimes you can see it and sometimes you can't, but we've all changed. We've all changed. Miriam, silly things, stupid things. Th I mean, you already mentioned, I mean, the horrible thing that your friend said to you <laughs> when, when you were in the hospital. I mean, I, I'm still like reeling from that comment, but I'm sure there are more, unfortunately. So yeah, so there are more in, in a specific COVID one. Um, so I'm one of the people who we talked about how some people are getting back to normal more easily and some aren't. So I'm in the camp that is not getting back to normal so easily. And so I, um, you know, don't get out much and I'm, you know, working on the exposure therapy and getting out more and what have you. But I have a, uh, this is sort of a silly, uh, hopefully it'll make people laugh, but I have a, a friend who um, wanted to see me in person, like outside at a park, but he had a cold and he was vaccinated, but he had a cold and there can be breakthrough. And, you know, so I said, I'd love to see you. We could talk on zoom. You know, I'm not comfortable seeing you right now with a cold. And he left me a scathing message about how much contempt he had for me. <laughs> it's not actually not funny, but he had contempt for me because I wouldn't see him in person and it was so offensive to him and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's just, it, that's sort of in the bad reaction, what not to say to people and um, that we, I mean, we, I know we'll talk more about this, but really um, it, it was funny because it, luckily it was a kind of friend that I could say, I cannot believe you said that to me. Like, why, why would you ever talk to me that way? You know, I have anxiety, you know, like I was able to, but I think in general, we're all navigating these different comfort levels and families are dealing with it and friend circles and whatnot. And I think being really sensitive to, you know, different comfort levels and not getting so mad or be quick to judge and all that kind of stuff when someone's just, you know, more easily, you know, able to get out or not wear a mask or whatever it is than someone else. I think that's something we really have to be sensitive to. I, I, absolutely. I, I mean, it's, it's happened within my own family. It's happened with, with people that I know and love. So I, yeah, I, I, oh, I I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm feeling mad for you, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just, I, I, yeah, in a thousand ways as a doctor, I, I'm just, I'm feeling mad for you. Um, and I've had like a bunch of colds in the last few months since being vaccinated and gotten COVID tested each time because, because. Me um, too. Me too. Last yeah. week. Last week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dr. Sultan. Okay. Wow. These are, these are really wonderful and, and uh, really illuminating. Um, I would say overall, when it comes to the disability community, you know, we need to exclude less. We need to be much more inclusive. We need to be more patient. We need to give people the benefit of the doubt. And my small anecdote is um, very much related to a friend of mine who had this unbelievable experience, unfortunately, very negative experience. She was on the subway and she um, wears uh, hearing aids. She's hard of hearing um, and uh, legally deaf. And she was on the subway and uh, this guy was in, you know, in the back of her. And um, I guess he was trying to say, please move out of the way, please move out of the way. And she didn't hear him um, because she, she reads lips and she wasn't seeing him in front of her. And so finally he pushed into her and she turned around and he said, what are you deaf or something? And she's like, actually, yes, I am deaf. And he just went silent. And I think, you know, I, I, I remember her telling that story and I, I think about it all the time because, you know, people, and many of us have alluded to this, you know, people live with invisible 
disabilities. They live with invisible mental health disorders, invisible physical health disorders. She has a hearing aid, which is visible, but when your hair is over it, it's not visible. And we just need, I think it just teaches us how we really desperately need to give people the benefit of the doubt. We need to understand that uh, people might be going through things we have that we have no idea about. Even when some people are taking up seats in the subway or bus and don't get up for other people, we never know what they might be going through. And I think it's just a reminder for us that we always need to keep a really open mind. And just one more quick example, and this is actually from a book. Uh, there's a wonderful book. Uh, I believe it's called Out of My Mind or Out of This. I believe it's Out of My Mind. And there's a um, character who's in, who's, uh, who uses a wheelchair and she has a verbal disability, she can't speak. And until she gets an augmentative communication device, um, people give her ABC books, they give her one, two, three books. They talk to her like she's a baby, even though she's 13 years old. And, um, and then once she's given an augmentative communication device in the book, they realize she's actually the smartest kid in the entire class. She is the smartest at math. She's the smartest at literacy, all of this other stuff. And so when we look at people who are sitting in a wheelchair or using a walking stick, who have a hearing aid, whatever it might be, or they have invisible disabilities, I think we always need to say, hey, maybe there's something else going on here. And I want to just mention one more because it's on the tip of my tongue if we have time. Um, and okay. this was really, is it okay, Amy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Go ahead. This is embarrassing for me, but I want to mention it because I think it really um, brings home the point. So every day I would bring my kids to, to the bus and I would come home and there would be someone who was sitting right in front of the front door of my lobby. And he would just sit there. And often I was walking in with a million groceries and he just sit there. He wouldn't open the door for me. And I was like, oh my God. And every time I came into that door, I just gave him like a more and more frustrated or angry look. And then one day I looked to the side of the lobby and I looked at, at the bench that he always sits on was sitting on the side and there was a little message on the bench. And the message said, um, I'm sorry, my son has autism. He needs to sit on this bench to wait for the bus every morning. Um, it, I hope it's okay to leave the bench here. And I just, here I am, I wrote a comic book series about disabilities. I wrote a musical about disabilities. I study disabilities. And it never occurred to me that that could be the case. When he would, you know, show gaze aversion, when he wouldn't open the door, never thought more of it. So it just reminds us so much that, again, we have no idea what people are contending with, what people are going through. You know what, I... I... I, we all, I, first of all, thank you. Thank you for sharing that because it really humanizes the entire experience for all of us. And I, I mean, I, I've made mistakes right and left with my insensitive comments and I, I've done it today, yesterday, the day before. And, and I'm the person who's also like, we each have our roles and we're all supposed to be the ones who are the most sensitive. And we know that we're not infallible. Like, so I think like, I, my question and Sarah, Sarah, Dr. Lippman, I want to ask you pointedly, and then I want to get to sort of the take homes, but I, you know, you, you, you alluded to this like comment when you were talking to Melissa about like, you know, your friend, your good friend who, you know, went through cancer and you know that she had, you know, a mastectomy and then she had, had, she had reconstruction and you gave her that compliment and you're like, Hey, your boobs look good. Right. And so like, that's a very specific situation where you know her, you're good friends with her, and you know that she can take the compliment in that tongue in cheek way because of everything that you've been through and because of your relationship. But the, the question is like, and it goes back to Melissa's point of where people were commenting on her 30 pound weight loss saying how good she looked. Like, is it ever appropriate, do you think, I mean, and, and we're going to do it because we're human. Like, when is it appropriate to give good comments, compliments? I, I, I mean, when, when is that appropriate? Such a hard question. Um, I, I only give the hard question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I just want to say first, I want to say, Nava, thank you for sharing that story. It was extremely moving. Um, and it, it really, it, it meant a lot to hear it. Um, you know, 
obviously with a friend who had reconstruction, that's very intimate. You're on a different level with someone, but I also want to say, Melissa, I'm, I'm sh I would assume you would agree that, you know, body image concerns when you have cancer, particularly breast cancer, are not just cosmetic, right? You know, people will say to me, I mean, I, and I did what I, what I didn't mention also in my introduction is that I spent a year doing a postdoc with cancer patients, improving quality of life with uh, cancer patients, both breast cancer and patients with blood, with uh, different blood cancers. And so people would say to me, well, I don't know why I'm so concerned. It's just cosmetic. At least I'm alive. It, it, there's no such thing. It is not just cosmetic. It is your identity, Right. It is your, it's who you are. And so when I said to her, your boobs look great, it wasn't tongue in cheek. I was telling her, her boobs looked great and she should feel good and she should feel like they are a part of her and that they are her and that this is this is who she is and she should own that. But the question, so I, I hope you agree with what I just said, Melissa. I just wanted to think. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the other thing with breast cancer specifically is, yes, it's who you are. It's, it's, it's you know, all of those things. But there's also this, this sociological oh. uh, association, especially in America, about breasts. And, and so that adds even another layer to it. But yes, Huge. I agree. Huge, right? Um, and that's why, like, it's it's not just cosmetic; it's so cultural. Um, but you know, can we ever compliment people? Compliment people? Yes, a hundred percent. Should we be? And I'll and I'll I'll qualify that in a second. Should we be commenting on people's weights? I would say ninety nine point nine percent of the time, no. Right? We should not be complimenting people as an entry point for connection. This is not COVID specific, right? If you are happy to see someone, you tell them you're happy to see someone. You don't tell them they look great. They might look great and you could tell them that, right? But you are happy to see that person, especially after all this time. I'm so happy to connect with you. Or Melissa, like you said, it's so hard to be back, but I'm so happy to see people, right? It's, I, and I've been saying this for years, it's about changing the focus of the conversation. Once you're having a connection with a person, right? Yes, you know, you want to tell them that they look great and without that being the focus of, you know, that's not who they are, right? You are happy to see them and to be with them and to talk to them and to, you know, have an intimate connection with them. So it's, I would say, yes, it's fine to compliment people not when that is the only connector though, right? Never when that's, you know, I mean, I'm the woman who on the subway tells the stranger like across the aisle that I love her dress, right? Because it's pretty and she should feel good, but I'm not trying to- And it's not about her body. It's not about her body, right? right? You know, and, and I'm not trying to build a connection with that. I'm not- Right. Um, but I personally, and I think, I, I feel pretty confident saying people's weights are not within the domain of something to talk about. Right. Unless, of course, it's a person who wants to discuss it with you. Even then, I would err on the side of walking away. Right. I would have liked to have said to my cousin, right, you know, Oh, you know, when she said you haven't gained the COVID-15, right? I could have said something, you know, I don't know, nasty back or about her body or about her weight gain or her weight loss. And, you know, 10 years ago, I might have, right? But um, I, we just can't engage that kind of conversation. That's where I would leave it. Thank you. I, I yeah, I think there's a lot there's a lot of, of wisdom there that, that we, people's body should just be off limits and, and it should be about connection. I, I, yeah, I think that that's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Okay. So um, to all of you who are with us, if you have any questions for our panelists, please put them in the Q and A, but as we close out here, you know, look, we, We've all heard the struggles now. We, we've gotten a little bit of a window, little bit into these areas. 
And so I'm going to ask all of you, what are your take homes for the audience? What do you want them to remember? I mean, we know we want them to remember that there is diversity in our communities. We want them to remember that they shouldn't just, you know, now that we're at this junction point where we're starting to come back, whomever is coming back, that things shouldn't just go back to before and they should just lead their lives. Like we should take this point as a reflective point and try to make it feel a little bit better, a little bit easier, a little bit different. And so how do we do that? How can we practically do that besides sitting and learning? What are some of your takeaways for people who are listening here? Um, Miriam, I'm gonna come to you first. Okay. Um, so one thing I would say, and that has been my mantra during all of this is control the controllables. So we can't, um, you know, I live in a condo. I, my, a lot of my neighbors don't wear masks anymore because the CDC said you don't have to. So, uh, you know, but I can wear my mask if that is causing me anxiety and I can do the things and I can decide where I go and where I don't go. And, and, uh, Dr. Lewin was talking about going to the, going to the Simcha, but, you know, wearing her mask, even though a lot of people weren't. And like, those are all things that we can, uh, control. And I think that's a big thing, um, to think about going forward, aside from what we talked about earlier, like the sensitivity and being mindful of everyone's at a different place and just really very mindful of if someone expresses to you, you know, that they don't want to do something or they're not comfortable yet, obviously being sensitive to all that. But I think for ourselves, a big takeaway is just knowing what we can control and what we can't and, you know, taking care of ourselves and doing what, what we can control and what works for us. And that's okay. And we'll, you know, it's okay to be where you're at with this because this is very new for all of us. And the transition back is new for all of us because there's still uncertainty. Absolutely. I love that. And I, I'm actually going to going to use that. And I think now that that tagline, we control the controllables. I think that's brilliant. I, but I'm going to push you a little bit further just for another minute or so. What, what would you say to everyone else? Like that's talking about individuals in, in your specific community, the ones who you help. What would you say to everyone else? How can they be more supportive or, or even start to begin to try to be supportive to individuals with mental health concerns, mental health issues? So yeah, it's a great question. So not saying, so there are a lot of things not to say, just like we talked about in other communities, there are a lot of things not to say. So if someone's feeling down, saying things like just snap out of it, or you'll get over it, or it's not so bad, or you have so much to be grateful for, all of those kinds of things are not helpful when someone is feeling very down and saying things more like I um, I'm here to support you. What can I do to help you? Can I, do you need me to go to the grocery store for you? You know, can I run an errand for you? Stuff like that. That's just an example. Those are examples when someone's very depressed, but that's just an example of, there are so many things that people say that are not good in um, when someone's going through a hard time and that are not only not helpful, but can be detrimental to the person experiencing that hard time. So I think being sensitive, being supportive, um, letting people know they're not alone. Also checking in. I think there's still an isolation factor. People did lose out on a lot of social experiences. So I think even, even just checking in, writing a text, a WhatsApp, thinking of you, how you doing, you know, anything I can do, quick things like that can mean a lot to someone who's feeling lonely and feeling down. And, you know, so I think there are things like that that we can be sensitive about and do and use the right language that um, can really make a difference in other people's lives. But, I think you're on mute again. You're muted. See, twice in one session. It's a new record. Um, the um, that that's it, yeah. The all those those take homes of the like the silly comments of the like you know just snap out of it. It's like all, all those things are. I think all of you can relate to all of that, and I think all of you are going to be talking about this and the like you know the take home points, but the practical practical takeaways of like checking in on people and continuing to check on people like that. I find is always so important in my community and I, 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 it makes sense that it's important in your community as well. Thank you. Melissa. Um, so um, from two different perspectives, first, if you're someone who's struggling, find the appropriate place to help, whether it's calling Shar Sharit, reaching out to a therapist, uh, someone you, or a close friend or family member that you trust, going online and looking for, you know, suggestions or places you can call, definitely reach out. For the community as a whole, I think it's three main points. I think 
please be kind and empathetic to those who are not ready to return to what you'd hope they would return to, whether it's going to a party, going to synagogue, going to the supermarket, whatever it is. But find ways to try and include them, whether that's dropping off a piece of cake afterwards, zooming a person into a party, whatever it is, find checking in, like you were saying, but you know, we really missed you next time. Um, but not reaming them out, as Miriam said. <laughs> we really missed you. You were missed. Don't worry, there'll be a next time. But be kind to them, find ways to include them. And then I think my, all of our biggest hope here is that the, the empathy and the kindness that we're going to pull from ourselves this, at, at this point lasts far beyond the transition um, and will give us all some insights as to how different people in our diverse communities are dealing with things on an ongoing basis, even when there isn't a, a global pandemic. And we'll all hopefully learn from this and make our communities much more welcoming, caring communities. That's the hope. That's the hope. Yeah. Um, that's the hope. Uh, Dr. Silton. Uh, you mentioned this, Amy, and I think that what we really want to think about is not how do we get back to pre-COVID standards? How do we become better than pre-COVID standards? How do we change our world in such a way that we've learned from this experience? As challenging as the experience has been, what takeaways, what kind of lenses do we have now that we did not previously have? So when you're looking at the disability world, right? Uh, think about accessibility, right? We understand accessibility on another level. I don't know how many of you saw Cuomo giving guidelines, but there was someone doing ASL when he was giving the COVID guidelines. There was captioning um, often when guidelines were given. So how can we ensure that whether we're teaching a class or whether we're giving important health directives that we use captioning, that we use ASL, we use American Sign Language, that signs are in Braille, that signs are, that we are, you know, looking at where ramps are, we're being extra sensitive and thoughtful. You know, when people, when parents have to fight for an IEP, they have to fight for an individualized education plan for their child with an intellectual disability or another form of disability, why should they have to fight so much? If someone has a physical dis disorder, right, they often get access to what they need to manage that physical disorder. In the same way, someone who needs services, right, shouldn't have, parents shouldn't have to sue. Parents shouldn't have to work so hard to get that those services for their children. So let this kind of COVID time be an opportunity for us to be strategic, for us to look back and say, okay, what could we do differently so when we welcome everyone back, now we're gonna to get to a really a, a better place. We're gonna ameliorate the previous situations. Um, and so, um, and I think what many of you said, uh, focusing on how can I help these people instead of judgment, instead of, uh, oh boy, you know, she looks different or he looks different or what's going on in his world. How can I help this person? I'm excited to see you. How can I help you get through a challenging time? And I think those are the things we wanna think about. How can we make this world a better place, right? I am sorry about the cliche there, but really how do we return to better than COVID standards? And how do we serve as, a, as the main source of assistance to allow people um, to really come back in in a very welcomed fashion? I, look, I think that, that that's really it, right? It, it's the, it's, it's, we wanna bring people in and the hope is that you know, these kinds of discussions will give people the tools and, and give them a little bit, make it feel a little bit easier to bring people in. But I, I, I wanted to like just pointedly ask you one more thing. I know that um, the, in, in specifically in the disability community, when there is an obvious physical limitation, there is this, um, there is this talking down this this sort of pity the oh do you, like talking talking to individuals as if they're children as if they can't hear as if they can't think for themselves etc cetera, etc cetera. I mean you were talking about that 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 example of the um the I think it was the the woman the the girl who needed this assisted device and what once they once she got it they realized that she was you know as brilliant if not more brilliant than the rest of them how 
practically speaking, and I'm, I'm asking for myself, practically speaking, how do we do this in a way that's not seen as pitying and sort of talking down? How, how do we do that so that it feels the, the essence that we're giving off is the genuine feeling that we're trying to convey without making people feel bad. I, I mean, I know you can't possibly answer this question in like a second and a half, but th that's what I, I really want to know. You know, so a lot of these things you're describing are, are like microaggressions when it comes to disabilities, things that we often don't, we don't intend to talk down to someone to be condescending, but we end up doing it. And sometimes it comes from a really good intention, but it comes off in a really unfortunate way. And I think, you know, there are lots of articles written about, you know, you see someone with a disability and your, your child stares at that, at that person, you know, you say, don't stare, don't stare, you just look away, right? That's not what this community wants. That's not what people with disabilities want for you to look away, for you to pretend that they don't exist. Ask, how are you doing? What's going on? Uh, you know, treat them like a typical, like treat them, you know, in a typical fashion, like you would treat anybody else. How are you doing? How has this time been for you? You know, uh, is there anything you need help with? You, you might not even volunteer. Is there anything you need help with? Because you don't want to make the assumption that of course they need help, you know, but just treating them like they are, you know, a person who has interests and passions and struggles, just like everybody else, I think is, is ultimately, you know, the way the way we want to go here. And, and some, you know, if they are struggling with certain things, you know, maybe they'll, they'll make you aware of that. And then that will give you an opportunity to offer assistance to offer help. Um, but, um, but yeah, you know, I think that uh, technology, I mentioned all of the problems with telehealth, you know, for individuals with disabilities, but there have been a lot of boons for telehealth for people with disabilities and for many of these populations. So again, let's get back to that, to a better than pre-COVID state. Let's learn what we have from Zoom. Let's take all the good that we've found and put it together to really, um, you know, we can't tie it in a perfect bow, but right. let's try to make it a much better state than, than we had right. before. Thank you. I, I know that I like I gave you an unanswerable question, but I, I just felt like I, I had to ask you a little bit of this because I know it's something that a number like I'm very conscious of and I worry when I try to engage people, I worry that I'm doing it wrong. And so I just felt like, you know, it was a selfish question really, but I, I, I needed to ask. Um, okay, Dr. Lippman, please close us out here. You know, again, we all look different, right? We all look different. We're supposed to look different. It's been 16 months, 15 months, 18 months, however you want to count it. We all are different. We look different. What do we do? You know, I'm not sure that, that I have much to add beyond what everyone has said, which is amazing. And there's a couple things, you know, of course, the empathy and the kindness is something we need to retain you know, this idea of moving not back to a new normal, or rather it's a new normal. It's not the old normal. That's right. It's a new normal. We don't want to go back to the old ways. But Nava, what you said, when the idea of not looking away, right? So everybody wants to be seen. Everybody wants to be visible, but for who they actually are. And so the one thing that I will add, which is what we've been talking about, is authenticity. Can we retain what COVID has allowed us to do? One of the things it's allowed us to do is be authentic because we were all struggling with something that we could talk about, right? And it gave us like back to that idea of that entry point, it gave us something to talk about, right? We don't need a global pandemic to be authentic. The next time someone asks you who, how you are, I mean, if you're you know, passing them on the street, like, hey, I'm fine. But the next time someone asks you how they how you are, you could actually surprise them by actually telling them how you are, right? Or when you ask someone how they are, you really ask them, how are you? How has this time been for you, right? Connecting with that person, connecting with people in an authentic way, bringing your authentic self and allowing people of people's authentic selves to come out and wanting and genuinely wanting to be there with people um, and being comfortable with 
who people really are, rather than whatever those social conventions or those social norms are, right? Whether it's someone struggling from a mental illness, someone who has a chronic illness, be it cancer or something else, someone who has a disability, visible or invisible, who is that authentic person? I, I don't know if all of you saw me, but I was glancing to the side during many points of this discussion because I'm also writing notes because we, you know, I, I have very much to learn as we all do. And I, there, there's so much that we've talked about tonight that I, you know, I, I need to be able to remember and I need to be able to make my interactions and my connections differently. So. Thank you, thank all of you. Miriam Ament from No Shame On You, Melissa Rosen from Sharsharet, Dr. Weinberger Lippmann, who is an eating disorder body image specialist, psychologist. <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, you know, I, I'm messing up all of your titles and all of your things, but I'm doing the best I can. And all of you will authentically thank me for that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and Dr. <laughs> Dr. Silton, a developmental psychologist and who's, who's done incredible work with disabilities, disability community and a million other things. I thank all of you. Um, look, everyone, this, is, this was a moment for us to take time and to learn and try to become a little bit better and, and try to interact with our community and our friends and our family in a little bit of a different way into the new normal, like this, this the, the authenticity, as Dr. Lippin was saying, and the connections. So I thank all of you for being here. There, there were a couple of comments in the, um, in the Q&A about how you know, different people just, they, they're passionate about this work. I've, there, there was a woman who was saying that she's passionate about this work because, and, and talking about these conversations because it just, it makes the world a better place. And so I thank all of you for being here. And I thank each of you, the panelists for being here and having this discussion. And this recording will be available um, on the, I was supposed to have a baby website and our YouTube page and, um, and good night. If any of you have any questions, you can reach out to me and or you can reach out to any of our panelists. And um, thank you all. Have a good night, everybody. Bye-bye.